Good morning, everybody. My name is David Fernandez, and my wife Lillian and I just moved to this area from Michigan. And a few weeks ago, Pastor Barry asked me to speak today, so I told him I'd be happy to do so. I used to preach quite a bit in Michigan before I moved here, so I'm happy to be able to share a message with all of you today. Let's have a prayer, and then we'll begin. Dear Lord, I ask that the Holy Spirit would be powerfully present here, not just in this sanctuary where I am here physically, but wherever anyone might be tuning into this, whether it's live or later on on a recording. Lord, we all came from different weeks. We all came from different highs and lows, and I just ask that at this moment you would help us to let go of anything that might be keeping us from being closer to you. Maybe we had an argument on the way here, or maybe there's some struggle at home, or maybe there are issues at work, or we're nervous about the world, or our finances, or who knows what it is. I just ask that in this moment we would trust you to get us at least to the rest of this church service so that we can be present with you, and that your angels would come into this place and go near to everyone listening, and would give them comfort and encouragement and would bind the enemy and cast him out so that you can truly have a victory in our lives today. Be with me now as I speak and give me boldness and let the Bible speak for itself, please. Amen. Many of you have probably read the whole Bible through from one end to the other, and I'm actually in the process of doing that right now. I probably read the whole thing in a jumbled up order throughout the course of my life, but Lately, as of, well, a few months ago, I started going through it chronologically, so to speak, at least from Genesis through the end. I guess that's not entirely true because I started with the New Testament and now I'm going through the Old Testament, but you know what I mean. And it's really interesting to see how the whole story of the Bible unfolds when you read it like that. A lot of times we just pick different points in the Bible and we go there and we read and we try to understand and we try to get a lesson from it. And that's definitely something that works. But what I'm trying to say is there's a different sense of context of the story of redemption that you get when you start from one end and go to the other. I mean, especially literally starting with the book of Genesis, the whole beginning of it all for us, as it were. And one thing that's really struck me more than ever before is as I'm going through the story of Israel as a nation, They keep going after what the Bible calls strange gods, the gods of their neighbors. They keep going after all these pagan deities and going into these religions that are absolutely different in every possible way from the God that we know is true. And I remember growing up thinking, especially as a teenager, what is wrong with these guys? They're literally worshiping an idol that they made with their hands out of a stone that they found on the ground or a piece of wood from a tree they cut down with a saw two weeks ago. And they're believing that that piece of, that inanimate object has some kind of power supernaturally to affect the events of their lives. I just couldn't take that seriously. I could never really understand it. But this time when I was reading the story, as I'm reading the story of Israel, I think maybe because I'm older and I'm a bit wiser, I've had more experiences and recognized my own shortcomings, it makes more sense why they did that. And if you pause for a second, you'll probably reach the same conclusion that I have come to, which is that in many ways, I'm exactly the same. I might not be worshiping a piece of wood or a piece of stone or the stars and the planets. But my heart is often very unfaithful to God. I mean, in the course of a day, every one of us knows we have certain thoughts or we do certain things that we know we shouldn't do. And there's a departure from the way that we know is right and the way that is good for us and the way that if we follow, we will ultimately have the most incredible peace and joy that a person could ever have. And so... As I pondered that, I realized, man, I'm really not that much different from them. But what is the deal? What, what happens when we turn away from God like that? What is the reason that we get distracted and we become taken up with other ways or other things that don't lead us closer to the heart of God? 
And what I've concluded is it's a momentary, or sometimes longer, lapse of a sense of identity as far as being a Christian is concerned. We forget whose we are. We forget that we have been redeemed because something tantalizes us and it's so tempting right in front of us in the short term that we decide that that looks like a better thing to pursue than the way that God has provided for us. And every time we've ever done that, to differing degrees, we know that the end result is dissatisfaction. The thing that was so amazing that we really wanted right now that we knew in the back of our head wasn't going to be good for us, that our conscience was speaking to it, against us about, ends up being very, very dissatisfied and leaves us empty inside and we feel bad and we have remorse and shame and we realize that it wasn't as worth it as it seemed in the moment and we have been deceived. And the reason I'm saying that is because I think a lot of us as Christians, especially in this day and age, are struggling to maintain a strong sense of our Christian identity. And what does, that, what does it mean to be a Christian? You can say it's all these doctrines and all these beliefs, which is true, but probably the easiest way that I've discovered it, to summarize it in is saying to be a Christian is to know that you have had an experience of redemption with Christ. It means your life was going this way at one point, and it wasn't good, and then you realized you needed help and you called out to God and he came and he restored your soul. Like Psalm 23 says, he restores my soul, right? He, God comes and he forgives our sins and he gives us a new start. And every time after that, that we ask for forgiveness, it's granted because of the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. And why is it that we as Christians often forget that that's what it really boils down to? You know, a lot of times it's easy to get distracted and say, that, uh, you know, and get so passionate about a particular topic and forget that everything that we do, everything we believe and everything that we, that, that guides our decisions should always center back to that experience of redemption. And I can tell you that there have been many times in my life when I have professed to be a Christian and even an Adventist and not had that experience of redemption at the core of my Christian experience. And I can tell you definitively that each and every one of those times, however long it was and whatever phase of life I was in, I did not have joy. I did not have peace. I couldn't tell you for sure, even though I had been baptized, if I knew that I would be saved, if I would go to heaven after I passed away. I, didn't, I was robbed of that confidence and the reason was because my identity as a Christian wasn't focused, wasn't centered on that experience of redemption. And conversely, every time that I have endeavored to keep that experience of redemption at the core of my Christian experience, I have been a different person. I can tell you that I have been full of confidence, full of peace, not confidence in myself and in my intellect or whatever other qualities or, or resources I might have, but confidence in knowing that the one in whom I believe has everything covered. Yes, I, mean, I should do my own part, right? It's not like we just say, oh, well, I've been redeemed and now God's just going to magically provide for all my needs when I'm capable of going and working or doing this. You get what I'm saying. There's always somebody that plays the devil's advocate and says, well, there's this. We're not going to go there. <laughs> but, but for real, every time that I've made that experience of redemption the core of my existence, it seems like things don't affect me negatively the same way they have when that wasn't the case. The world can be in chaos and I can see fellow believers confused and, and, and all concerned and everything like that. But I, at, in those moments I, I have peace. And why is that? It's because I know what God has done in my own life. There's a quote, I believe, from the book Life Sketches and I believe it's page 195 and it says, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. What does that mean? It means that often we lose that focus on our experience of redemption with Christ at the, as of being the center of our Christian experience when we forget how God has taken care of us. Something happens in the world. There's war in Ukraine and, and we get so concerned about that and then we forget, wait, God has always taking care of us and 
you know, my life is really in his hands because I gave my life to him. And so no matter what happens, for better or for worse, I just trust him to get me through the day and to get me through my life. And yes, that is an unfortunate circumstance, but it doesn't have to rob me of my peace, which comes from knowing who God has been to me. And the Israelites, in, in all of their woes, had that same experience where they allowed other things to take their focus to the point where they abandoned God and went into completely perverse religions, the details of which are not appropriate to discuss in this particular setting because something else seemed better at the time. Another idea, another way, another, some other type of pleasure. And they went after that and only found bitterness. And as I was preparing for today's message, I discovered that it seems like there are three things that really frame us in life. And the first is our beliefs. And I believe that our beliefs are informed by our life experience. For example, somebody who has a bad relationship with a parent is going to find that if they don't find healing for that, it will affect their other relationships and it will even affect their way that they view God most likely because they will most likely view God in the same way that they view that parent that they have an issue with. Conversely, if that individual has a good relationship with the other parent, it's, it's probable that that good relationship will also influence the way they view God and they will have diametrically opposed views of God and that will provide, that will create cognitive dissonance that makes them struggle with who they believe God to be to them. There are a lot of examples of, of that sort of thing that we could go into. Our beliefs are informed by our experience, right? If I have a bad experience with a particular business, I probably am going to be more likely to write off everybody in that particular business as being the way that that individual or those, those individuals treated me instead of giving them a second chance. Maybe some of you are more gracious than me, but that's how I am naturally inclined to be, right? And so our beliefs are informed by our experience. And our beliefs frame our sense of identity. For example, as Christians, we believe that God is fundamentally loving and gracious. Other religions believe in gods that are not fundamentally loving and gracious. And that makes it more like they're serving out of fear rather than out of love and gratitude for what the God has done for them. Another example is that our God is always willing to take us back. I guess that's another way to say gracious. Many other gods, I, what I was trying to say with that is, we are saved by grace through faith. That's what I was looking to say. Other religions are saved by works. And if you're honest with yourself, you know that you can never do enough good to right the wrongs of your past because they're always there. Only in the Christian faith do you find that being saved by grace through faith can absolve you and can free you and heal you from the sins of your past, liberating you to move forward in peace and confidence and joy. And so our beliefs are informed by our experience and our beliefs frame our identity and both of those things together can give us peace because when we're in difficult or, or doubtful times, we can look back on the experience that we've had, which has f informed our beliefs and given us our sense of identity. And if we remember when everything seems to be going crazy, that God is good and he is taking care of us and he is forgiving us and he is always looking out for our best interests and he does always want us to be close to him and he doesn't, just want, and he doesn't want to push us away because we did something wrong, but rather wants to embrace us, man, that goes a long way, doesn't it? If you know that that's the one in whom you believe, then you can be confident. And there's a story in the Bible in Luke chapter 15 that I'd love for you to read with me. If you have your Bibles, please feel free to turn there. Luke chapter 15. And it's a very good story about somebody who struggled with their identity. Someone whose beliefs became altered at one point, And then he had a moment of clarity and went as fast as he could in pursuit of the peace that he had had before. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. This is the parable of the lost or prodigal son. And it says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, 
Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Verse 15. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed a fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed a fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Sometimes we're more like the, the older brother who is behaving himself. Some of you guys are that sibling, the one who never got in trouble. You always behaved, you did everything right, and got straight A's probably. I wasn't that brother, that was more my brother. Not that I went as far as the younger brother, but I can definitely relate to that story because it shows the ways that we ebb and flow in our Christian life. Sometimes we're more focused. Sometimes we get distracted and we go the wrong direction. But what does it say in this parable about the father? It says that the father was gracious and he, as soon as he saw him, he ran and hugged him and kissed him. Does that sound like a father that was contemptuous and, and bitter and wanted to push away? that son because he had done something wrong or does it sound like he was gracious and full of mercy and wanted to restore the intimacy the union the, the closeness the friendship that there that had been there before see if we have a harsh view of God or a view of God that makes him out to be harsh toward us when the world is in chaos we will find it difficult to believe that he sympathizes with us and actually cares about the details of our lives. However, if we have a view of God that goes perhaps to the opposite extreme and considers that God is only gracious and does not have any standards and does not expect good and excellent things from us, then we will also be disappointed because that God doesn't exist because that's not actually real love. True love gives you the freedom to choose what you will do, how you will act, and who you will be. But it also expects greatness of you. And God expects greatness of his children. What does that mean? 
Here's an example. Sometimes we're in a situation where we feel prompted by that nagging little voice that says that we should say something or do something to minister to another person. And for many of us, that's an uncomfortable moment because it means that we're probably being pushed a little bit outside of our comfort zone. And we don't like to be pushed out of our comfort zone. Some people really like to work out. They love pushing themselves out of their comfort zone. Other people don't like working out and doing anything is being pushed out of their comfort zone. But take that same person who loves being pushed, 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 pushed with exercise and put them in another arena in which they're not as confident and they will immediately experience the same, comfort as, the same discomfort as a person who doesn't like to work out when they have to do exercise. So sometimes God encourages us prompts us to say something or do something to minister to somebody else to share a little bit or maybe a lot about what God has done in our own lives. But we feel often so powerless and so lacking in boldness to follow through with that command, with that prompt, don't we? And I'm ashamed to admit to you that more times than I would like to stop and count, I have ignored or suppressed that voice because it was going to make me uncomfortable. And in those moments, I lacked the boldness that I should have had if I had just simply paused and thought about all the ways that God has been incredible to me in my life. And the world needs us to be bold. See, some people mistake boldness for tactlessness. They're so concerned about offending someone that they would rather err on the side of what they believe is extreme caution and not saying anything or doing anything, even when they're prompted by the Holy Spirit, which I think knows better than us, than actually do what they are being led to do. And why is this? I think it's because Western society is more lost than ever before. It is completely struggling in its sense of identity because we have adopted postmodernism, which tells us that there's no absolute truth, which is like the most ridiculous claim of all time because that in and of itself is a claim of absolute truth. So, I mean, it falls flat on its face right there, but we don't stop and think. And so we believe in, in, the fa- in all these things. And, and then pluralism has attacked us, which means, which is an extension of postmodernism, saying that multiple truths can be true at the same time, regardless if they contradict each other and then we've gotten to this place where there's such a a push for political correctness that everybody's afraid of being called out for some imperfection because we're such a graceless society now that people have been robbed of their boldness for what they believe for better or for worse because they don't want to be ridiculed and so what happens here In North America, specifically in the United States, the Christian church, and specifically the Adventist church, because that's who we're part of here today, is struggling to grow because we're struggling with boldness, because we're struggling with a sense of identity, because we're struggling in what we believe, because we're not taking the time to remember what God has done in our lives, to inform our beliefs, reinforce a strong sense of identity in that grace of God, and then move forward in life in peace, and and confidence because we know in whom we have believed and what does that mean the conclusion of this is that people are just being eaten up by stress inside on a daily basis hoping and wishing that there would be some catharsis that there would be some way that they could be relieved of that burden they're feeling like they have to be perfect because if they deviate from the line even by just a little bit their career could be canned or something else could happen or their people could threaten their family. I mean, this is real stuff. It's crazy. And Western society is not, it's very shameful and it's very unfortunate because Western society used to be characterized by being the champion of truth. And now look at us. We don't even know what truth is. People tell us, just live your truth or I love how they're living their truth. What does that even mean? means they're doing what they think is right, but the person who says, I love how they're living their truth, or just live your truth, is living a different kind of truth than the other person, and they believe that they're different, but somehow they're both equally acceptable. 
That's not true. That's not how truth works. There's truth and then there's falsehood. There's goodness and then there's wickedness. There's righteousness and then there's evil. There's nothing that's in the middle. And we have to wake up and stop being lukewarm as a church and recognize that we need to be, that God is holding us to great expectations. He's holding us accountable for the light that we've been given. We need to go and be bold in this world. Maybe that means some of you need to be more active in this church and stop ignoring requests to be involved. Maybe for some of you, that means you need to call that person that you've been feeling in the back of your head. You need to call, but you don't want to because it's been a while and it's, and it's going to be uncomfortable. Maybe it's that you have, to, you have to ask for forgiveness for something that you did wrong and you don't want to do that because you're too proud. Well, how about all of us stop being arrogant because those are all different forms of arrogance and we just decide that we will do whatever it is that God instructs us to do and whatever he calls us to do regardless of the consequences. And those consequences are usually some kind of negative pushback or feedback from people. Regardless of if somebody doesn't like what we have to say or what we believe. Because here's the thing. All these people who are so rabid, it seems, or, or so full of animosity, just so bitter at the world and constantly trying to cancel everybody else, are secretly dying of fear inside from two things. Number one, they struggle with extreme self-loathing because they're trying to hold themselves to a perfect standard and that standard is always shifting because society continually says, no, 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 now you have to do this or no, 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 now it's not enough that you do this, you have to go over here and do this. And people are confused. And so, lest anyone know how turbulent their hearts are and how confused they are and how fearful they are of straying from society's dictated line of conduct, they just act like they're the righteous ones and they're calling everybody else out. And you know, I think that's so sad. And I think it's so sad that the Christian church has not done a good enough job of depicting what grace really is. Because if it had done a better job, probably we wouldn't be in this society right now because so many more people would not be struggling with this extreme self-loathing and perfectionism. And it's basically feudalism and nihilism. Because they'd recognize that there's a way in which they can find redemption there's a way in which they can find grace and that would give them peace and confidence to live a bold and virtuous life. Because there, many of them are trying to live virtuously. They really are, but they're misguided. They're going the wrong way about it. And because of the other issues that I described, it creates a perfect storm of chaos in their mind and they're so dissatisfied. But see, as Christians, once again, we return to that sense of identity. If we know that we have been redeemed, then who cares what somebody says if they don't like the fact that we believe that we've been redeemed? Right? I mean, really, why is it such a big deal if society doesn't agree with us? The Bible tells us, Jesus himself tells us in the Bible, that being true to God will incur the wrath of the world. And once again, do not misunderstand me. I'm not advocating tactlessness. I'm not advocating being brash or rude. I'm simply saying... Do what God has called you to do. Be the person that God has called you to be. Say the things that God has called you to say. And do it with complete boldness. Because at the end of the day, whose opinion matters more of you? God's or some person on Twitter? <laughs> I mean, really. In these stories in the Old Testament that I've been reading, I've been amazed by the times when God has led the children of Israel, for example, in battle or against completely overwhelming odds. For example, when they're leaving Egypt to go to the promised land, the Egyptians are right on their tails and they are catching up to them and there's the, the Red Sea right in front of them. And it seems like they're at an impasse and nothing can be done to save them. And they start immediately, <laughs> immediately saying, oh, it would have been better for us to have remained as slaves in the land of Egypt rather than to be caught by the Egyptians out here stuck in the middle of the wilderness. 
oh my goodness. And then what does God do? He says, just, just watch. If I have led you this far, will I not continue to lead you, even if you don't understand? And see, here's the thing. Many times we believe that we're smarter than God. And what I mean is, we believe that if we can't fathom or come up with a way that God could make something happen for his glory, if we, believe, if we don't seem to see the solution to the problem, we believe that God is powerless to make it happen. And that is so arrogant. That is absolutely arrogant. I mean, we don't know more than God. Some of you are doctors in here, and yet there are still lots and lots of things about biology and physics that you don't understand. That doesn't mean you're not smart. It just means that our, limited, our understanding is limited. And so the Israelites are at the Red Sea, and they don't believe that God can save them because they can't see the way out. And all of a sudden, what happens? The Red Sea parts, and the bottom of the sea isn't soaked with water. It's dry, and they get through that part and they go across and the Egyptians are coming, they're coming, they're coming and then God lets the Red Sea close over top of them and the Israelites are saved. And then they celebrate. But then time after time again they keep falling because once again they keep losing sense of, that, of their identity. And the world needs Christians who are strong in their identity, who have taken the time that they need to know God and to have that rich, deep experience of salvation, of redemption, of rejuvenation, restoration that he affords us. And some of us are too busy spending time watching TV or on social media or doing whatever else it is that occupies our mind and we're not strengthening ourselves spiritually. We know that as time moves forward, things are going to be more difficult for us as Christians if we're truly remaining faithful to our beliefs and to our God. Remember that Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Then Jeremiah says in chapter 31, verse 3, The Lord has appeared to me of old, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Isaiah 30, 15, For thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved, and quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Now some of you might be wondering why I called my sermon, God Has Tattoos. It was a pretty weird title, right? I hoped that it would get your attention. And the reason is because of the scripture that I wanted to use in conclusion today. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 15 and 16. Feel free to turn there with me today. Remember, your experience informs your beliefs. Your, your beliefs frame your identity. And your identity and your beliefs together are what determine if you're going to be able to get through difficult and doubtful times with peace or if you're going to be afraid. Isaiah 49, verses 15 and 16 says, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? If any of you are parents out here, you're probably thinking, man, it would be really hard for me to not care about my kid anymore. Granted, there are moments, I'm sure, when you're like, why are you being so difficult? I'm not talking about those moments. Talk about in general, right? But God says here, surely they may forget. Even with all that love, they might even still forget. Yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. God has inscribed your name on the palms of his hands. Every time you do anything with your hands, you're, you, you're looking at them most of the time, right? Or they're at least within your peripheral vision. And you know that they're there. You don't often think about it. But think about it this way. Whenever God does anything and he sees his hands, he has your name literally chiseled into his hands. Or tattooed is another way we could say it in our 2022 language. And I imagine if you or I had literally cut someone's name into the palms of our hands or at least tattooed it there, which I hear is one of the most painful places to get a tattoo, it would be really hard for us to not notice that the name was there whenever we did anything. And that name 
would always be in the forefront of our minds. See, God has your name on his hands, and every time he does anything in the universe, he knows about you. He remembers you. He cares about you. He's working for your good. Regardless of your ability to understand his purposes, he is working for your good. Don't mistake consequences of your own poor decisions as God's just vengeance against you. That's just, that's just how it goes. When you make a poor decision, there's a, there's a negative consequence. But no matter what happens, God is working everything out for your good. That's what Romans 8.28 tells us, doesn't it? I'm going to read that real quick because some of you may have forgotten what that says or maybe haven't known it before. Romans 8.28. got it memorized, but sometimes I get the words backwards. So I'll read it for safety here. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You are called according to God's purpose. Therefore, he's working everything out for your good. Therefore, you can know that that is what drives his experience with you. Your experience, or, or you are part of his identity forever. You are literally part of him now. And Jesus will forever have the marks of the crucifixion in his body. We are literally permanently part of God's identity. So my appeal for you today is whether it's the first time that you ever do this or it's time for you to affirm this again, that you choose to find your identity in Christ, that you find yourself meditating more and more on the redemption that is yours in God. Because if that is what defines you as a person, the beliefs that will extend from that experience will be absolutely able to withstand all the pressures of the world. They will be absolutely able to, un to withstand all of the doubt that society throws toward us. They will absolutely be able to withstand the difficulties you go through in life. And you will have peace. You will. Isaiah 26, 3, last verse as I close here. Isaiah 26, verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So that's my invitation to you today. Let your minds be fixed on God. Let your identity be found in him. Let your beliefs emanate from that place of peace. And now go forth and change the world as you Live that truth. I have a closing prayer now. Lord, I pray that we would have such a strong sense of who we are in you that nothing would dissuade us and that nothing would be able to cheat us of the peace that you so eagerly and happily give us that our very existence may influence other people to turn their eyes toward you so that they can have the same experience as we do. Lord, if there's somebody who's struggling with their experience with you right now, maybe they're feeling apathetic, they don't feel, they're numb, they don't feel like they can connect with you, I pray that you would give them the peace that they need in the way that they need to understand it in this exact moment. Let them have belief that you, can, you will grant this to them and that you want to. Let us each be renewed today, and as we leave this church, I, I really, really ask you that you will help us to be able to be agents of peace in this world that's so confused and so on edge because that's what you've called us to do. Give us boldness, please. Amen.